the new spring church, everybody. I'm going to invite you to stand your feet with us. Y'all might know this one, so help us out, all right? Here we go. Well, I can't count the times I've called your name some broken nights. And you showed up and patched me up like you do every time. I get amnesia. I forget that you keep coming around. You ain't no way you'll ever let me down, down, down. Good God Almighty, I hope you'll find me Praise your name no matter what comes Cause I know where I'll be without your mercy So I keep praising your name at the top of my lungs Come on now, tell me he God. He's God. He is good God Almighty. You say your love goes on forever, that your mercy never stops. So why would I assume you'd be somebody that you're not? Like the sun in the morning, I know you're going to be there every day. So what on earth could make me be? Afraid. We are entering into his presence together this morning, just lifting up the name of Jesus, saying that he's good. Anybody else here believe that he's good today? Yes. Well, thank you guys for singing with us. Go ahead and have a seat. My name's Austin, and I just want to be one of the first to welcome you to New Spring Church. If this is your first time, 50th time, 100th time, we're just so glad that you're here. But if you're looking for ways to uh, engage in conversations, if you have questions with us, there's many different ways. You'll see people walking around this building with staff badges that are uh, happy to answer any questions or point you in the right direction. But one of the ways that right now that you can uh, connect with us is by texting talk to us or talk to us. Yep, there it is, Talk House, to 97,000. And uh, just begin a conversation if you want to get plugged in or if you just have questions about who we are, what we're about. Happy to answer those questions for you guys. We're glad that you're here. For those of you who don't already know, next weekend is Mother's Day. So. That was a shock. That's why so many people didn't respond initially. It is. John Parker, our percussionist, we were sitting in our, uh, in our studio and he said, hey, if you guys are looking for a good deal on roses, you can go to Costco. And I just thought to myself, why would I need roses? And that was him loving me well as a friend. That's good looking out, that's, that's experience right there. But no, we're, we're excited to celebrate Mother, Mother's Day with you guys next week. And Mark is gonna bring a powerful message. Uh, and I don't wanna get too far ahead of it, but it's a uh, it's really great opportunity for us to celebrate not only mothers, 
uh, you know, because motherhood is not necessarily just a function of the womb, but a function of the heart. So it's also about celebrating people who have been a mother to you. So make sure that you celebrate those people as well. And you do not want to miss out on the blessing that is going to be next weekend. So uh, please put it on your calendar to be here. Uh, we're about to start into a brand new series called DNA. But before I jump into much more about that, September 23rd, put it on your calendar as well. Concert in the park in Andover. We're praying for good weather. And we ask you guys to be praying with us about that event. It's going to be a great opportunity for us to reach our community. So start inviting your friends. It's going to be a great night. Uh, but we are jumping into a brand new series called DNA. And if you're new to New Spring or you've been here for a while and you've had questions about who we are, where we're at, maybe our history as a church and where God is taking us, this is the series for you. And Mark has a message talking about a little bit more about that. So check this out. And thanks for being here this morning. If you're new to New Spring Church, let me explain to you who we are. We believe New Spring Church exists for people who aren't here yet. Now the irony, it's one of those Jesus ironies. Those of us on the inside, we get more blessed than we've ever been in a church in our lives while we're busy being about people who aren't here yet. But what we discover is Jesus is like, I'm gonna give you a green light as long as you're thinking about the people that I'm most concerned about. And nothing can stop you but your own vision. All right, New Spring, go ahead, stand on up and join us in worship again as we proclaim who it is that we have victory in. If you didn't know, his name is Jesus. I heard an old, old story, how a Savior came from glory, how he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sin and won the victory. what we're shooting for here. So go ahead and sing with us. The second verse goes like this. I heard about his healing of his cleansing powers revealing how he made the lame to walk again and cause the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory Oh, victory In Jesus My Savior Forever He sought me and bought me With His redeeming blood He loved me yeah, I knew Him And all my love is to Him He loved me To victory He need the cleansing Call it going to play so smooth one. She's got the victory. If you got it, go on and clap your hands. Say, oh, victory in Jesus. Say, my Savior. My Savior yeah. forever. Say, he sold he me. Saw me. and bought me. With his, with his redeeming with love. He loved me and I knew him. And all my love is to him. He loved me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. walking in victory this morning. 
because of what Jesus did on the cross. So we've got a message for our enemy today. Don't mess with the blood of Jesus. Come on now. Say, oh, no, you've done it now. Gone against the king. Gone against the crown. Oh, no, you've done it now. It's time to feel the fire. Say, rumors spread around. How could you think he would stay down? Rumors spread around. You're nothing but a liar. So I say, get on out of here, get on up and leave, ain't no one ever gonna tread on me, he's choking on the blood and ran down the tree, ain't no one ever gonna tread on me.
excited to be in God's house today. Y'all can go ahead and have a seat. I said this in the first service. Um, you have to know I have a, a passion, a love of worship music, and when I grew up, I had different groups that I would listen to. My favorite CD of all time, uh, and it was hard to find even in the 90s when I got it, but there was a CD from Andre Crouch, and it was called Live in London. And I loved that album. I played it so many times. I wore that CD out if it's possible to do that. And um, I always thought, man, it's such a shame I couldn't be there. That concert happened way before I was born. I thought it's such a shame I couldn't be here. And Miss Carla on the piano and, Miss D and Mr. DJ doing Victory in Jesus. It was like being there, right? It was like being at the concert. So thank you guys so much. What a blessing. Uh, I'm so excited. By the way, those of you who are prepared to take the offering, y'all can go ahead and come forward and do that at this time. Thank you so much for doing that. Um, by the way, uh, I just want to share some warm thanks with you all. Uh, my wife and I were on one of our walks through the neighborhood uh, yesterday, and we realized that as of yesterday, we've been at New Spring for 11 years. We came here in May 1st, 11 years ago. And I have to be honest with you, I wasn't exactly sure how I would be received. I knew that, that people would, would receive us warmly, but I also knew I'm the pastor's son, I'm coming to work at this church, I wonder how they're gonna feel about me. And let me tell you, you guys have just taken us into your hearts and loved on us and accepted us as one of your own from day one. And this has been the, the greatest 11 years and we can't wait to see what God does in the future. So thanks for letting us be part of the New Spring family. We've enjoyed it so much. Now, we have a couple of things I wanna make you aware of here at New Spring Church. I'm not gonna be back up here for a little while, so I do wanna take my opportunity to talk to you about a couple of things I'm involved with that I really want you to know are available to you as New Springers. Um, we have two ministries that are groups ministries that are specifically oriented around difficult seasons in life. One is called Grief Share, and Grief Share is for anybody who's been through the loss of a loved one, and that's been such a common experience for many of us over the past year. Um, so if you've experienced the loss of a loved one, it doesn't even have to be recent, it can be some time ago, but if, if it's something you still need to work through processing, we have a wonderful ministry, it has a great curriculum, great group time, I'm there every Tuesday night. Um, my wife and I are very passionate about this ministry. You can check that out at newspring.org slash grief share. And then we also have something called divorce care, and that's for if you've been through a painful separation or divorce. Um, it's a, a place where you can come and process the pain that you're going through. And again, a wonderful curriculum, great group time. And I'm wanting to ask you this as a personal favor, because I've become very, very strongly believing in the power of these things to be healing. So if you know somebody, even if they're not a new springer, and they're going through the loss of a loved one or they're going through a divorce, do us a favor, would you? Would you pass on that address to them? Let them know to check it out here because we would love to, uh, to love on them and uh, to try to be there for them in that difficult time. All right, well, I can't believe we're at the end of the Anger City Limits series, uh, but it's been a wonderful one. I can't wait to be back in just a second. I'm gonna bring a talk called Loose Cannon. Be right back. Thanks for joining us today. Here are a few upcoming events we want you to know about. Join us for worship, communion, and a message at our first Wednesday service this Wednesday, May 5th. We'd love to see you there. Our service begins at 6.30. Make plans to celebrate mom with us next weekend. We'll have free family photos and a few more surprises to make moms feel as special as they are. Get details at newspring.org slash celebrate mom. Interested in volunteering at New Spring? Join us May 16th for volunteering where you can tour through our ministries and learn about the different volunteer opportunities we have available. Register online to take the tour. Remember, you can always learn more about everything you just heard at newspring.org. Enjoy the service. should have stepped foot in my town, boy. But you're lucky. It's a beautiful day to meet your maker. We don't have to do this, Rage. I never wanted any trouble. Oh, you don't have to do this, Rage. It's too late for that now, boy. I've had enough. Take your place and prepare to die. It's gonna be good.
What are you doing? Don't you know how a duel works? You stop right there, little man! Don't you come no closer! Come here, big guy. No, I don't want you, no! It's okay. No! It's all right. No! Shh! Oh, I hate this, but I love it. Sometimes people ask me, what's it like to work at New Spring Church? <laughs> and I say, it is like working with the biggest group of irreplaceable people that have somehow formed a team that you could never replicate. That's what it's like. It's like the coolest job in the world, getting to come together and work with these people. For our, the guy who designed the graphic to be the guy, the mean guy with the beard who's, uh, who's rage, you know, um, I mean, God has just done some really cool things. I want to give him all the glory for the fact that there's no way we could replicate this team. God has just been very, very gracious to us, and it's wonderful that we get to be serving such a wonderful church, so thank you for that privilege. We're in a series called Anger City Limits, and the reason that we decided to do this, and it's no small thing, when we decide to do a series on a topic, we pray about that. It's very important to us that we don't waste time. We want to make sure that we're on the main roads, that we're, we're picking topics that are, that are going to be particularly helpful. And the reason that we picked anger as a topic is because it seems to be kind of on the rise in our society. And I think that's predictable, right? We know from research that when we have unhealthy levels of stress, the higher those stress levels get, the more likely we are to get triggered into anger. It, in a sense, unhealthy stress primes the pump for anger. And it's been a stressful season, right? I think all of us have experienced that. Are you stressed out? I am, right? It's been a, it's been a tough season. So I think anger is easier for us to go to. But one of the things that we've been talking about since the beginning of this series is that as Christians, we need to be very careful with how we deal with our anger. Anger is not inherently good or bad. It's an emotion that alerts us to the fact that there is injustice or unfairness. It's what we do with that emotion that's so important. And since the beginning of this series, we've been saying that James 1.20 says that human anger does not produce the righteousness that God requires. And the emphasis on the idea of human anger comes from the fact that in the Bible, we're told that ever since sin entered this world, which happened with our first parents, Adam and Eve, ever since that happened, the world that we lived in has been, is broken, and you and I have been warped as a result of sin, which is why I've brought up every week of this series, I've brought up this warped carpenter square. And this sort of represents the idea that if you have a, a reliable carpenter square, you can use it to measure to see if things are straight and square, and you can use it to fix things if they're not. You can identify what's right and what's wrong, and you can fix it. But if you have something like this tool where it's all warped and bent out of shape, what you're going to find is that you're inaccurate at measuring things, and you're, when you try to fix things with it, you're going to make it worse. And that's what the Bible's saying when it says human anger does not produce the rightness or the perfection that God requires, that because we are, in essence, warped in the way that we view the world and in the way that we would fix it if it was our world, right, that often in anger, this is the biggest expression of our warpedness is that we do things that cause problems. But the Bible does say that God himself is righteous. It says, the Bible tells us that God has a perfect standard. So our whole series has sort of been oriented toward we need to lean into God's instructions for how to determine if something needs to be addressed or not. And we need to lean into God's instructions about how to deal with it. So it is not wrong for us to feel anger, but what we have to do is make sure that we lean into God's directions for how to deal with it, and that's what we've been talking about. The first week, we talked about what happens if somebody gets angry with you for no reason. We talked about King Saul and David and this vendetta that Saul had against David, even though David hadn't done anything wrong. And we talked about what happens when somebody just has it out for you for no reason. Their anger has made your life miserable because they're coming after you all the time. And then the second week, we talked about what happens when you're mad about the wrong thing. We talked about the prophet Jonah that God sent to Nineveh 
to preach against the evil of that city. The people in the city were, were doing these terrible things, and God sent Jonah out there to preach to them and let them know that he was gonna destroy the city as a result of this evil. But Jonah turned out to be a particularly successful preacher. When he preached about this, the people said, all right, well, we wanna turn around then. We don't wanna do these evil things anymore. We wanna honor God, and hopefully God will change his mind. And God did change his mind. And you would think that as a prophet of God, that would make him super happy. But instead, it made him super angry. And we said, sometimes it is interesting interesting that we get mad about the wrong thing. There's really nothing to be angry about, but somehow we get it in our spirit to be angry. And we said, how do we deal with those times when we're cranky for no reason at all? And we said, God gave Jonah some anger counseling. He said, is it right for you to be angry about this? But we don't know where he put the inflection. So that's where we spent that week. We said, maybe he was saying, is it right for you to be angry about this? And that would have been in the sense of, is it working for you? Is it having the effect that you want. Is being angry right now getting you what you want in this situation? Most of the time, uh, it, it isn't. The second thing he could have said, is it right for you to be angry about this? Because of all people, Jonah should have known what it's like to go as far away from God as you possibly can and get a second chance and have an opportunity to go back and do what God has called you to do. So of all people, it seems like Jonah would be the last person who should feel this way. And then the third thing is we said, maybe it was that he was saying, is it right for you to be angry about this? Of all the emotions that you could pick, and there are a bunch, Why pick anger? So that's kind of where we were in week two. Last week, we talked about what happens when you're angry about the right thing. You're experiencing legitimate unfairness, legitimate injustice, something wrong, something that somebody has done to you to injure you, and you experience that anger. But what happens when instead of dealing with it God's way, we take revenge? And we talked about Moses. And you remember, Moses, through a weird set of circumstances, ends up the adopted grandson of the Pharaoh in Egypt. So he grows up really as an Egyptian, lives in the Egyptian uh, palace with the Pharaoh, but he is by birth a Hebrew. And the Egyptians are keeping the Hebrews as slaves and abusing them. And one day Moses is confronted with that right in his face. And he sees an Egyptian, one of the guys that he's buddy-buddy with, that he lives in the palace with all these Egyptians. He sees an Egyptian beating a Hebrew, which is one of his countrymen, And so in in that moment of rage, he kills the Egyptian. And we said it was not wrong for Moses to feel angry. That was correct that he should feel angry about that injustice. What was wrong was for him to go off script and to take revenge. We said there were three things that should have indicated to him that he was getting ready to go off script. One is he had to look both ways. The scripture says he looked both ways before killing the Egyptian. Anytime you have to double check to make sure nobody else is watching before you act out in anger, that's a problem. We talked about how often we'll say things in anger to a spouse or our kids, and it seems perfectly appropriate. But if we were to put another person there to hear us talk to our kids that way or to hear us talk to our spouse that way, we wouldn't do it. So if I have to look both ways first, that's always a bad indicator. The second thing is he had to up the ante, and that's the thing about revenge is that we almost never meet force for force. We almost always ratchet it up another notch, and that's what Moses did. The Egyptian was hitting the Hebrew. Moses hit and killed the Egyptian. He took it up a notch. And then finally we said he had to bury the evidence. And there's a theme in the scripture because Moses, Moses buried the Egyptian. There's a theme in scripture that is that if any time we have to hide what we've done, there's, there's a real problem. So we kind of worked through that last week. This week we're gonna finish out the series continuing to talk about what happens if you're mad about something legitimate. What happens if you're angry because there is a true, real injustice staring you right in the face? And we're gonna talk about is our propensity to act out in desperation. You know what it's like in that moment when you're staring that in the face, your, 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 your blood begins to boil, your blood pressure goes up, your heart rate goes up, you get that slightly sick feeling in the pit of your stomach and it just feels like the world is in a bad place and in desperation you feel this intense motivation to do something. I don't know, have you experienced that? You get really angry and it's like, I gotta do something about this, I gotta do something. But I don't know if it's been your experience, but when we act out in desperation like that, it usually causes problems. And we usually have a phrase for that. When somebody says, why did you do that? You know, we got mad, we did something destructive, and somebody says, why did you do that? Our phrase is, well, I just lost it. By the way, what is it? I don't know, for me, it's my better judgment, my my common sense, my understanding of right and wrong, my realization of what the consequences are gonna be. It's like all that flies out of my head at one time, right? And just act out in raw emotion. I experienced this early on in my married life when I I think I've got it pegged, I must have been 23 because Wendy was expecting our first child. 
Um, and we were in a season of our marriage where we had terrible conflict. And if, if you've been to any of our marriage seminars, if you've read any of my books, you know that we, that was our problem early on in our marriage is that we had tremendous conflict. And we were in the middle of one of those fights in our car. And I, my, my recollection is that we were driving, we had visited family in Wichita. We were dri- driving back to Oklahoma city. Now we had a huge car, um, it was called a Buick Roadmaster. I don't know if you've seen these things. It's, it's a chick magnet, really, is what it is. Um, and uh, so my wife is driving, and I'm sitting in this. And the reason I tell you how big the car is, I'm, I'm a tall guy, but I had my legs crossed, and I had a lot of room between me and the dash. And we are getting angrier and angrier in this fight. It's just getting ratcheted up more and more, and I'm getting so angry, I feel like I have to do something. So my leg that was propped up on my other leg, I lifted up, and I kicked the dash as hard as I could to show how angry I was. The problem was that we had just armor all the dash. And when you armor all a dash, it makes it slick. So when I kicked the dash, my foot slipped and hit the windshield. And I shattered that windshield. We had to drive all the way back home with the shattered windshield. And then on top of that, we were very young. We didn't have much money. And buying a new windshield was not something that was easy for us to do. And I very quickly lost that fight in a profound way. You know, that's... That's a way to lose your argument real fast, right? But this is, what, this is what I think is true about when you lose it. If you've done that before, I mean, I've done that several times. If you've done that before, here's my guess. My guess is you probably acted out of character. I mean, even then, I would say that I had anger problems when I was in my early 20s, and I would say that it, it was part of my life that I was having regular conflict with Wendy, but even at that, I would say that this is an extreme example. I would say this is out of my character, that even people that, people that knew me at the time would, would tell you, yeah, sometimes Jonathan has a temper issue, but not to that extent. This is kind of beyond for him, right? So it's out of character. The other thing that I can probably guarantee is that you probably caused damage that required repair. If you lost it, you probably acted out of character and you probably caused damage that required repair. Um, In Edinburgh, Texas, there's this high school that has a pretty strong football team. One of their players, his name is Emmanuel Duran. Hope I'm pronouncing his name correctly. Um, And his stats are really good. My hunch is he was being watched by scouts for big colleges and potential really, you know, a great career in in football. And, um, but one night in a football game last year, uh, he, was, he had come off the field and a referee made a call that involved a play he had just played in and he was so angry about that call that he charged back on the field and tackled the referee. <clears throat> and he tackled him so hard that the referee slammed back down onto the field, hit his head, had to be taken to the hospital, and Emmanuel Duran was taken off the field by police in handcuffs. Now, here's the thing. I don't know that young man, but I'm gonna guess that this is out of character for him. I'm not saying that he doesn't have anger issues. I don't know. I don't know the guy. But I'm going to say that my hunch is this is probably extreme for him. This is probably an extreme example. And it certainly caused damage that required repair. It caused physical damage to the referee. It caused damage to his team. His coach got put on athletic probation, whatever that is. His team got pulled out of the playoffs. They didn't get to keep playing in the playoffs. Um, And on top of all that, Mr. Duran is facing some legal challenges. So it, it created problems. And As much as uh, I recognize that as wrong and I feel really bad for that referee, there's also a little part of me inside that feels bad for this young man because I've been there. I know what it's like to act out in anger and then five minutes later go, oh my goodness, what have I done? And how am I going to fix this? If you've ever been there, I think it's fair for us to ask the question, what went wrong? Because we're only ever going to be able to change it if we can figure out what's happening. And we're wanting to talk to you today about a person in the Bible who was profoundly influential in the Bible and in the early church, the Apostle Peter, but even somebody who was as close to Jesus as the Apostle Peter lost it. And we're going to talk about how he lost it, and then maybe we can find a few lessons that will be helpful for us to help us know when we may need to adjust the way that we're approaching something and then also to give us some guidance about how to understand how to even not fix, but how to work through the aftermath of these things so that we can experience those things being repaired and getting better. So we're going to go to the book of John 18. If you have your Bible or your electronic reading device, uh, we're going to be in that passage most of the time today. Um, And in John 18, we're coming to the end of Jesus' ministry. Jesus is getting ready to be arrested and tried, even though to say a trial is hard for me because it was such a silly trial. There there, There was no basis for it, so it wasn't a real trial. But Jesus is going to be arrested and tried and crucified, 
And you and I know because we've read the Gospels that after Jesus is crucified, he's going to rise again. And we have this overarching picture of the gospel, this understanding of what Jesus is trying to do that is even fleshed out more in the rest of the New Testament, we have the benefit of hindsight. We have the benefit of knowing what all is going to happen. But as you put yourself in the place, as you get ready to read this passage and put yourself in the place of the disciples the night of Jesus' arrest, I want to remind you that they do not have the whole story. And not only that, but the story that they're expecting is not the story that's going to happen. The disciples did think that a hard turn was coming in Jesus' ministry. They kept hearing Jesus talk about the kingdom of heaven, right? I'm not sure they heard the heaven part a lot, but they definitely heard the kingdom part because they expected that Jesus was going to set up a kingdom here on earth. That's one of the reasons why they constantly bickered with each other about who was going to have the highest authority in Jesus' kingdom when he set that up. So in this point, at this point, they're really an itinerant ministry with Jesus, but they're expecting this hard turn to come where Jesus is going to take his, use his authority to set up a kingdom, and they're going to have the highest privileged roles in that uh, government under Jesus. And so they're expecting a hard turn, but let's face it, the hard turn that they're going into is not the one that they're thinking is going to happen. So you do have to prepare yourself for the fact that if you're one of the disciples, when Jesus is arrested, that is a shock. Now I'll hand it to you that Jesus had been warning the disciples that this was gonna happen. But it's very clear that the disciples didn't understand. And I've heard preachers preach against the disciples. How could they not know? Jesus was telling them specifically what was gonna happen. How could they not know? Well, I don't know. I just gotta say, I think there are a lot of times when God is trying to tell me something very specific and somehow I didn't get it at the time. So I gotta give the disciples credit for the fact that that happens. I think Jesus was trying to tell them, but they didn't get it. And so John 18 is probably one of the most traumatic moments for Jesus' disciples that you can imagine. The Bible says the leading priests and Pharisees had given Judas a contingent of Roman soldiers. Now, there's two ways to interpret this. If we were to take this word literally that gets translated contingent, it would mean 600 to 1,000 Roman soldiers. There are some Bi- excuse me, Bible scholars that say it couldn't have been that many. Rome wouldn't have sent that many people. So maybe the word was intended to be a smaller number, a smaller, like a subset of a contingent, and that would have been like 200. Frankly, I trust the word. I think that there were 600 to 1,000 soldiers, and I think the reason that Rome did that is for shock and awe. I think they didn't want any incident. I think they wanted it to go smoothly, and so I think they were willing to send out an entire contingent of Roman soldiers just to make sure that this thing went down. And they also knew there were a lot of people who had been healed by Jesus, and there were a lot of people who believed Jesus' teaching, and they didn't know how many of these people they were going to have to deal with. So I think Rome was happy to send a full contingent of soldiers in. They come in with blazing torches, lanterns, and weapons. They arrived at the Olive Grove. Jesus fully realized all that was going to happen to him. I mean, this is not a surprise to him. He understands what's going to happen. He steps forward to meet them. Who are you looking for, he asked. Jesus the Nazarene, they replied. I am he, Jesus said. By the way, anytime you see I am in the scriptures, it has a special significance. This is a way that God identifies himself. And it's a special way of identifying himself. We think we understand existence. We understand what it means to be. We have being verbs in every language to express the idea of being. And God is saying, I exist in a way that you don't even understand. My existence is beyond your understanding of what is or what is to be. I exist at a level that is beyond human comprehension. So I'm basically just going to tell you I am the existent one. I have existed from the beginning. I will exist through eternity. And by the way, that's exciting for Christians because that means that we get to exist with God through eternity as well. So when we die, it's not the cosmic stop sign. Someday they're going to put me in a box up here and y'all are going to file past and say that I look, you know, doesn't he look real? No, I look dead. And it's fine for you to say that I look dead. <laughs> but, but because God is eternal and he identifies himself as the existent one, This little shell that they put in a box um, will be done for, but the real Jonathan is going to exist with God forever and ever, and that's beyond what I can even understand. He says, I am he. And that wasn't just a powerful statement verbally, it was a powerful statement physically, because as Jesus said, I am he, they all drew back and fell to the ground. And the Greek word there for fell indicates that they were pummeled to the ground. They were slammed back onto the ground. By the way, these guys are not used to that. These Roman soldiers are buff. You know those old goofy sitcoms where somebody's really going to let somebody have it and they're going to punch him in the stomach and the guy just stands there and acts like nothing fazed them, you know? That's the Roman soldiers, right? They're used to winning every fight. They're used to being the strong guy in the room. Nobody wants to take these guys on. They ask Jesus, you know, or Jesus says, who are you looking for? They say, we're looking for Jesus. He says, I am he, and suddenly they get knocked on their rear end. 
And I have to believe, this is, this is one of the funny, minutes, funny moments of the Bible. I, do, I, have a, I have a quirky sense of humor. Sometimes I read the Bible and there are certain things that make me laugh out loud when I try to imagine what it must have been like. Because once more Jesus asked them, who are you looking for? Now I'm thinking about this Roman soldier, probably six foot nine, 350 pounds, leading this contingent of soldiers who's just gotten back up off the ground, just dusted himself off, trying to figure out what in the world just happened. And Jesus said, who is it again you're looking for? And as that soldier, I'm thinking, I don't want to tell you. (laughs) Jesus the Nazarene, I told you that I am he, Jesus said, and since I'm the only one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose a single one of those you've given me. He's saying, look, let these other 11 guys, not 12, because Judas is in on it, let these other 11 guys go. Then Simon Peter drew a sword and slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest slave. You can't make this stuff up. He cut the guy's ear off. But Jesus said to Peter, put your sword back into its sheath. I almost called this gun, put your gun, I almost called the sermon, put your gun back into the holster, but I thought better of it. Shall I not drink from the cup of suffering the Father has given me? Well, there's a lot of things going on in this story. If you read the crucifixion account in the different gospels, you're impressed with the fact that there's so much happening and there's so much significance attached to all of this. But if we just take a minute to look at this one little slice in time, when Peter, out of desperation, slices off the high priest slave's ear, there are a couple things that are clear. One is that Peter did this out of anger, and that makes sense. We experience anger when somebody is unfairly persecuted. Jesus, the person he'd followed all these years and never saw him do anything wrong. I mean, some of you have great bosses and your boss, you just love working for them, but you still know that they're imperfect. But can you imagine following Jesus? Jesus never did anything wrong, not a single thing wrong. And it is this guy that suddenly they're slapping the handcuffs on. I worked early in my ministry counseling a a person who came in to see me who had been arrested and then exonerated. There was evidence that proved that, uh, that it wasn't him. And he was talking about the, the trauma of getting arrested when, it, when he knew he hadn't done anything. Imagine the trauma of being Peter, following Jesus, knowing Jesus hadn't done anything and watching him get arrested. I, I gotta give Peter credit for the fact that, yeah, of course he was angry, I'd be angry. I think anybody would be angry in his shoes. So I think one thing is clear, he did it out of anger. But the other thing is this, it's clear that what he did wasn't right. In Luke, we're going to see that Jesus said, no more of this, kind of thing my parents used to say, no more of that. Jesus said, no more of this, and then he said, put your sword back in its sheath. So it's clear that Jesus is saying, no, this this wasn't the right thing to do. How can we break down what went wrong? Because if we can break down what went wrong, maybe that can educate us on how we can press pause when we're upset and not act out in desperation. One of the first things we teach couples in our work with them uh, on conflict, because Wendy and I, because we went through so much conflict early in our marriage, that's kind of our thing. We work with couples on co- conflict a lot. One of the first things that we tell them is, if you can slow down the conflict, you will almost always be better off. Because negative things in conflict, the, the most destructive things, that's the word I was looking for, the most destructive things in conflict tend to happen fast before we think about it. So if we can kind of understand what went wrong with Peter, maybe we can learn how to slow it down a little bit and make better decisions. So here's the first thing that I think should have been an indicator that something was going wrong, and that was that it was the wrong time. It was the wrong time. So check this out. When this happens, Jesus is talking. And since I'm the one you want, let these others go. He did this to fulfill his own statement. I did not lose any, I did not lose a single one of those you have given me. Okay, so I want you to think about this. What is happening in the story? If you're outlining the story, what is happening in the story right now? What is happening is Jesus is negotiating the release of the 11 disciples. He is in the process of making sure they don't get arrested. Now you tell me, at the point in time when somebody is negotiating your release on the premise that you haven't done anything wrong, is that the time to commit first degree assault? I don't think it is. It was weird that this is when Peter chose to pull out his 
sword and slice off this guy's ear. It's in the middle of when Jesus is trying to negotiate his release. And by the way, there's more significance to this because notice that it's saying that the reason that Jesus is in the process of doing this is to fulfill his own prophecy, that he's not going to let any of his guys get arrested. So this isn't just about that moment. This is verifying that what God has said is true. Peter is getting in the way of a lot of stuff right now. When I've lost it, I can't tell you how many times looking at it in retrospect, I think, what all was God trying to do in this situation that I just made it a lot harder for him to do? We talk about testimony. Sometimes you hear believers talk about, I don't want to do something because I don't want to ruin my testimony. What are they saying? They're saying, God is at work doing something in this waiter's life. I don't know this waiter, but God is at work doing something in this waiter's life. And when this waiter aggravates me because they don't come out with my food on time or because my food doesn't come out prepared the way that I want to, and I let loose on them and their staff, and they know that I go to New Spring, or they know that I'm a Christian, or they know, and who knows how they know that. I may not know this person from Adam, but they may know me through channels. Then have I made it harder for God to do what God is doing in this person's life because now they have a different impression of what God is about? It was the wrong time. It was then, that's why I underlined then here, it was then that he drew the sword and slashed off the right ear. So often I ask myself, Jonathan, why'd you have to do it then? You could have done it any, you could have done it all these other times. Why then? Why couldn't I have just waited? So many times I've asked myself, why couldn't I just wait? And by the way, this is in Psalm 27, where the Bible says, wait patiently for the Lord, be brave and courageous. Yes, wait patiently for the Lord. Notice that there's twice an emphasis on being patient and once in the middle, an emphasis on being brave and courageous. Now, this is hard for me to digest because when I think about being brave and courageous, I think of that as an action thing, acting out in bravery, acting out in courage. Uh, in courage. And yet, in this case, we're talking about pressing pause in courage, about waiting as a sign of bravery. In essence, God has called me to be a brave and courageous waiter. And that's hard. I mentioned before uh, that my wife and I have been here for 11 years. Before we came, about 16 years ago, our church went through a major transition. We had been a very different kind of church, and there was nothing wrong with that. We were a great church before, and it was the church that I, I grew up in. Um, but my dad had a strong feeling toward the early to mid-2000s um, that we needed to take on a new focus and a new way of doing things. And that new way of doing things was going to be based on the fact that our whole church mission was going to be about reaching people that are outside our doors. That our whole life was going to be about reaching people who are spiritually unresolved. And what he understood was that meant that we were going to have to change a lot of what we were doing. That a lot of churches said they were about reaching people outside their doors, but my dad realized that if we were going to actually do that, there was going to have to be some painful pruning, there was going to have to be a lot of changes that were going to be made, and it wasn't immediately clear whether everybody would understand what all those changes were about. And, it, and what ended up happening in that process was three groups kind of developed out of that. There was one group that caught the vision and they stayed. I remember in the last service, I was scanning the room and I saw somebody who was a charter member of this church. Um, and uh, this individual is one of those who really just caught onto the vision, embraced it and stayed with us. Um, and there, there are multiple people, I, I'm looking around the room, I see them right now that decided, yes, I'm on board with that, I wanna stay. There was another group of individuals who in love and in respect said, this is not really the right fit for us. If we make this change, this is not really the right fit for us. And, and that was completely understandable. We were getting ready to make major changes, so it was completely understandable that they would say, maybe that's not for me. And there would be these positive, affirming conversations between my dad and these individuals, and there was love on both sides of that. And to this day, there's love going both ways in those relationships. And God has done some great things because in that season, we spread out over Wichita a little bit, and it, get, and it gave us an even greater influence. That was a good thing. And, and fortunately, those groups I just talked about made up the majority, but there was a group of individuals that were determined to do as much damage on the way out as they could. They got angry about the changes that were gonna happen in the church. Um, they did not like the new vision and they felt that the new vision was, was wrong and, um, and it got very personal in that my dad, having served as the pastor for so many years of this church, became sort of the target of their anger. And they would say things to him that to this day are very hard for me to think about. 
And I knew these families. See, we, we grew up, when I was a kid, we, this was on the old property uh, back on Hillside Mount Vernon. Our house, the pastor's house, was right across the parking lot from the church. And so people would come to our house at all hours with issues and problems, and my dad would go and make hospital visits for some of these people at two o'clock in the morning. My dad had done funerals for some of these people. He'd done weddings for them. And I knew that my dad would have done anything for them. And there was this sense that, that there was harmony that had suddenly been destroyed, and there was all of this sort of caustic anger coming at my dad. And I didn't understand how could people act like this. It didn't make any sense to me because I thought my dad hasn't done anything wrong to them. And so I would get defensive. I would talk to my dad on the phone. My dad, to talk to my dad on the phone is kind of like an instant antidepressant, right? You can call my dad, and if you're getting an IRS audit, by the time you get off the phone, you're gonna think it's a good thing. Like, I'm really excited about this now. I talked to Mark, and I think the IRS is really fabulous. I can't wait to get audited, you know? Um, He's just like that. And this was one of the only two times that I can remember in my entire life talking to my dad and getting off the phone and saying, he's not okay. He's not okay. He would tell me he wasn't taking these things personally, but I know my dad, and I knew it was hurting him pretty badly. So at one point, we were on the phone, and I decided that it was time for me to tell my dad what to do. I'd heard that as you become an adult, you eventually start to tell your parents what to do, so I thought, this is my chance, you know? So I told my dad, I said, you need to get up in the pulpit and you need to cut loose with these people. Because I said, they'll leave, but at least they'll be out of your windshield and you can move on. You just need to get up in the pulpit and you need to go for it. And he said, I'm not gonna do that. I said, dad, if you're not gonna do that, maybe God is calling you somewhere else. Yeah, I said it. (laughs) Looking back, it would have been the worst advice he could have followed. I mean, you and I can see what God has done. But in the moment, you know what was talking to my dad in that moment? I was desperate. I was desperate because I hurt for my dad, and I was angry at these people, and I was just saying things without really thinking about it. But there was a pause on the phone, and my dad, my dad said something to me. He said, Jonathan, God is going to give you green lights on certain things, and he's going to give you red lights on other things. And if he gives you a red light, you've got to respect it. And he's like, you're trying to get me to to move on something that God has not given me permission to move on. He's like, I have a bunch of green lights. God has given us open field to run in for our church, and we're going to do that. And I'm going to invest my energy there. But in terms of what you're talking about and investing a bunch of energy and trying to fight this, I have a red light, and I'm stopped. You know, the funny thing is, actually, isn't that what courage in the scripture is about? I spent this last week looking at passages in the scripture about bravery and courage, and almost always they're about respecting God's traffic signals. It's either about being willing to go when God gives you a green light, but you don't want to go, like the children of Israel going into Canaan, or, you know, going into the parted Red Sea. There's this sort of idea of, I don't want to go, but God's given me a green light. Courage means I go, but there's also so many times when I want to go, and I've got that energy inside of me that's like, I got to do something about this, but God gives me a red light, and courage at that moment is saying, all right, I'm going to respect the red light. I'm going to wait. It was the wrong time. Second thing is, it was the wrong tool. It was the wrong tool. Romans, Roman soldiers had a certain kind of sword. It was called a gladius. It was at least 44 inches long. It weighed several pounds. It was very wide. Sometimes you'll hear people refer to them as a Roman broadsword, sharp on both sides. And the reason that it was super wide is that it was designed such that if you managed to hit somebody with it, they would die. It, 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 was, it was designed to be broad enough to do arterial damage wherever you hit somebody. So even if you hit them in a limb, hopefully the Romans thought they're going to die because it's so wide. And the Romans conquered a good portion of the world at the time using these particular swords. <clears throat> so these, you know, nearly a thousand soldiers are all armed with these heavy, broad, long swords. But Peter would not have had one of those. those the gladius was a military sword. But Peter, Peter wouldn't have been able to, you know, one Bible scholar said this, for Peter to walk around town with a gladius would be like entering your local grocery store carrying an AK-47. You, you would just say, that isn't right in this context. You know? So Peter would have had something that he could hide, 
And it would have been either what was called a machiris, which was a small hand weapon. It had a blade that was about 16 inches long, weighed about a pound and a half, or it might have just been a fisherman's knife, which would have been shorter still. So let me ask you a question. If you're up against 600 to 1,000 guys with 44-inch long, 8-pound swords, exactly what is it that you think that you're going to do with a 16-inch blade that weighs a pound and a half? Now, if Jesus had told Peter that... I'm going to give you the supernatural power to hack your way through all these Roman soldiers with that small knife. Now, I trust that. I believe he could have done that. But he was off script. Jesus didn't tell Peter to do this. Peter was off on his own. And I guarantee you, that little knife is not going to get him through a contingent of Roman soldiers. And in a sense, we could say, the tool wasn't strong enough to address the problem. So it's not going to deal with the problem. And yet it was strong enough to create new problems. I don't know if you've experienced that in anger. But it's like, there's the sense in which, I don't know what it is in our gut that thinks, whatever it is that I'm doing to act out in anger, it's going to fix this. But then after the fact, we realize that was such an inadequate weapon to deal with the problem, but it was enough of a weapon to cause a whole new problem. I told you I have a weird sense of humor. Just thinking about that ear lying on the ground and all those soldiers just staring down at it. Like, did that just really happen? That didn't make much sense. By the way, this was a problem of incredible significance that Peter did this with this tool. Keep in mind that when Jesus, Jesus is getting ready to have this crazy, weird, bogus trial, and it's so important for all of eternity that in that trial, it is true that there is absolutely nothing can accuse Jesus of. No legitimate charge. And think about what Peter just did. He just gave them a legitimate charge. Jesus' trial would have been completely different because now they actually have something that they can say. They can say that Jesus incited this person to commit assault onto one of the high priest staff. Such a huge deal. And we think, I'm gonna, I'm gonna fix this but we don't have enough power to fix it, but we do have enough power to create a new problem. That's where Peter was. All right, I'm running out of time. Here's the last one. So we said it was the wrong time, it was the wrong tool, and then finally, it was the wrong target. Check this out. It says that when Peter drew a sword, he slashed off the right ear of Malchus, the high priest's slave. So I want you to think about this for a second. Malchus is probably the least complicit person in what Peter is angry about. Malchus doesn't have any choice about whether or not he's there. Malchus isn't there because he wants to be there. Malchus isn't there because this is his idea. He's there because he has to be there. And somehow, of all the people that Peter went after, he went after the person that doesn't have anything to do with this. Now, here's here's what I think, and I could be wrong, but I think that Peter meant to cut the head of the high priest off. That is my belief. And I think that he, being a fisherman and not a swordsman, swung a little wildly, not really particularly well aimed, and who knows, perhaps the high priest was very athletic and did one of these, you know, duck kind of things. And I think when that happened, Peter accidentally lobbed off an ear of the high priest's servant. But it's so much more a lesson for us if that is true. Because too often in life, our anger is motivated by one person or situation, but when we express our anger, we miss them and we hurt somebody else. As a society, we're mad at a virus. It doesn't have a face. It's not somebody you can express your anger towards. And that anger, in my opinion, in many cases, is coming out on our kids, it's coming out on our spouses, it's coming out on our coworkers. Instead of the real target of our anger, it's hitting other people, collateral damage. Or maybe it's your boss. You're so mad at your boss. And you know that if you expressed your anger to your boss, you'd get fired. So instead, you go home and you talk to your wife and you say to her the things that you want to say to your boss. It's almost like in the process of telling the story, you say, and what I wanted to say was da-da-da-da-da, but you're saying it with the tone and with the aggression and with the facial expression. You're basically using your spouse as a punching bag to let them feel what you would like somebody else to feel, but you can't let the other person feel it, so now your spouse is feeling it, and your spouse is your support team. And we accidentally hurt somebody that's not even complicit in in the problem. 
well, what are two lessons from Jesus that we can learn in this situation? Because there is an ear lying on the ground at this point in the story. And Jesus has to deal with that. And I don't know what you've got going on in your life, but there may be an ear lying on the ground in your life. It's easy for me to look at situations where I've lost it and recognize that I've created damage that needs to be addressed. Maybe that's what I would take away from this series on anger is that maybe I have some addressing situations to do today. Maybe you have some addressing situations to do today. What are some things we can learn from Jesus? Well, the first thing is about how we can change our approach. And that is that just because you have it doesn't mean you should use it. It was okay for Peter to have a sword, but it was not okay for him to use it in this way at that moment. Some of you in this room, you have a razor sharp wit and it makes you funny and everybody loves to be around you. You have that dry humor that's so fun to be around. But when you get angry because you have it, you use it and now instead of it being funny, that razor sharp wit becomes a dagger with which you stag stab somebody and they feel the jab and the dig of it and it causes damage and then you have to repair it later. Some of you have the gift of an authoritative voice. There are ladies and men in this room that if you raised your voice right now, you'd get all our attention, right? That's not a bad thing. But when you get angry, just because you have an authoritative booming voice doesn't mean you should use it. Some of you, you're a debater. God has given you the spiritual gift of debating and you can come up with a good argument in any situation. But just because you have the ability to argue against any proposition doesn't mean you should use it when you get angry. Emmanuel Duran has an amazing tackle. And who knows, maybe it'll get him into a great college team and the pros someday, I don't know. But just because he had a great tackle didn't mean he should use it on the referee. Just because at 23 I had abnormally well-developed calf muscles doesn't mean I should use it on my windshield, right? I'm so taken by Jesus' statement, put your sword in its sheath. What is it today for you that if Jesus could talk to you, he would say, put it back in its sheath? Maybe it's the thing that you say to your spouse that you know pushes their buttons. Maybe it's the thing that you say to your kid because you think it'll motivate them, but it's actually hurting them. Maybe it's the way that we say it. Maybe it's the thing that we just get caught doing whenever we get mad. Whatever it is, what is it that Jesus would tell you, put it put it back. Now, that was where I was going to land this talk. And that was good because I'm already in overtime. But I've added one more thing because I felt the Holy Spirit really pushed me very hard to put this in and so I could not not do it. And that is this, even when the sword is put away, there must be healing before moving forward. It's really important. Look at this in Luke. Jesus said no more of this and he touched the man's ear and he healed him. Just because Peter put the sword back in its sheath doesn't put the guy's ear back on. So if you go home today and you determine, I'm going to put the sword back in its sheath, the thing that I've done in anger, I'm going to, I'm going to quit doing that it, through God's grace. I'm going to have setbacks, but I'm going to make, make a decision that I'm going to change the way that I do this. Even if you put it back in its sheath doesn't mean that the damage that was done before when you were angry is going to immediately, magically go away, because it won't. There's gonna to have to be a season of healing. You say, Jonathan, so is it my responsibility to heal the other person? It's not only not your responsibility, that is not in your capability set. Notice that Peter didn't heal this guy's ear, Jesus did. So if you put your sword back in its sheath, you're gonna to have to step back and say, God, only you can heal the person from what I've done in this situation. I've been desperate, I've lost it, and I've done stuff that requires healing now. And I can't heal this person because I don't have that in my skill set. I'm gonna do what you asked me to do. I'm gonna put it back in my sheath. That I can do. But now I'm gonna have to step back and I'm gonna say, God, please bring healing here. And here's the thing. There's something in the humility of a spirit that says, God, I'm gonna put it back in the sheath. I'm gonna wait for you to bring healing. It seems like God always smiles on that and says, all right. I told you at the beginning of the message, Wendy and I had a very rough first few years of marriage. But you know what? Over the years, God has taught us to put it back in our sheath and he's brought healing to both of us. And I'm happy to say that there are very few things I remember. I remember the windshield. 
There are very few things I remember, and it's because God is that great. If you leave this room and you say, I'm, man, I'm struggling with anger. This is a problem for me. I want you to know it doesn't have to be this way. It can change. Thank you for being here for this series. Let me pray for you. Father, thank you so much for the fact that you love us enough to teach us how to manage our emotions. Father, we pray that as we experience anger, you would redirect us to do what is your will in the middle of difficult situations. Help us to push the pause button, to wait until you say go, and help us to use your righteousness to measure whether we are right or wrong to interact and then how we should interact to try to make things be better. Now, Father, in this world where anger is a problem right now, we pray that you would give us the capacity to be salt and light, that you would allow us to be an example of difference makers in this world that experience your love even in the middle of frustration and injustice. And we'll thank you in advance for all that you're gonna do through that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for being here this week. We'll see you next week.